In this episode of TTSA Talks, we go behind the scenes with COO and Director of the Science and Tech Division, Steve Justice, and we explore his extraordinary journey from Lockheed Martin Skunk Works to To The Stars Academy. Well, hello, everybody. This is Lou Elizondo, and welcome to our sixth episode of TTSA Talks. Today, we are going to speak with none other than the man, the myth, and the legend himself. (laughs) <laughs> Mr. Steve Justice. Steve has a tremendous background in aerospace engineering. I'm going to let him tell you all that. But he also has a lot more to him than I think meets the eye. Uh, to some degree, Steve may be a bit more of an enigma than, than the UAP phenomena itself. I've had the honor and pleasure of working with Steve now for over the, like the last three years. And it's truly been a privilege, Steve. Uh, I can't thank you enough for your uh, friendship and your mentorship and your advice and assistance and guidance. And I think the whole company would extend their deep, profound appreciation as well for what you're doing for us and frankly, what you're doing for everyone else. So with no further ado, Steve, how are you? I'm great. Thank you. I don't even know what to say after that. I, I, I don't normally get introductions like that, but thank you very much for the kind word. I appreciate that. One of the things that's been really special about stepping into the environment at TTSA is the, the personalities that come in, the people, their backgrounds, and quite honestly, the diversity of the the backgrounds coming together into these conversations that just go all over the map. You know, you and I have had conversations that have gone all over the map. We've been at the whiteboard drawing things. We've flipped through endless PowerPoint presentations, but it, it's been fun. And, and I feel exactly the same way. I, I stand in amazement of what you did. When we first got together and you were telling some of the stories of your background, it was one of those things where, you know, I felt totally inadequate, you know, like I had wasted my entire life. Oh, gosh, no, Steve. <laughs> I will jump in there, too, and, and let you know. I know from my past experience in the government, I know the types of programs and projects you worked on. And a lot of times, you know, when you're in that type of environment, you only see one side of a human being. Everybody associates Steve Justice as being, you know, the really senior guy at Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, the guy who's building an airplane we may never see for, you know, 50 years. But there's this human side to Steve Justice. And that's what I want to do a little bit today is maybe get into a little bit of that. Over the last two years, people got to know you through the television show, through history's show, Unidentified Inside America's UFO Investigation. But let's talk a little bit about you. The the first question I kind of want to know, I don't think I've ever asked you this. Where did you grow up as a kid? I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee. So you, you can hear the Southern drawl inside my voice, even even though I moved away from home when I was 18. So um, that's a draw. That's a Southern draw, not a speech impediment. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> I consider it to be, you know, the Southern gentleman portion of me that is still ingrained in me saying, sir, you know, military and all that kind of stuff puts sir into your regular vernacular. The Southern upbringing that I have is what puts sir and ma'am into my common terminology. So yeah, that's a, that's a South thing. So yeah, I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee, went to school in both Florida and Georgia, ultimately graduating from Georgia Tech with an aerospace engineering degree. And uh, my first job was at General Dynamics in Fort Worth, Texas, working on the F-16 and F-111. They delivered the very first production airplane to the Air Force. I think it was the second week I was there. They had a big ceremony down on the floor, and all the employees came down there. And and, and in that photograph someplace of all the employees gathered around the first production delivery airplane, I'm in there somewhere. Yeah, that was 1978. Let's talk about that for a second, Steve. You you mentioned the F-16, and and we've often talked about that in previous episodes about the maneuvering capability about the F-16. Why don't you explain for our audience a little bit, what is an F-16 and what made that particular aircraft so unique and revolutionary at the time compared to all other aircraft? One of the things that was really amazing about the F-16 was it, it was the first airplane to incorporate the I'll call it the next generation of flight control technology in a production airplane. NASA had experimented with this system called fly-by-wire, where instead of the pilot's control stick 
moving control surfaces, the control stick actually gave inputs to a computer, and then the computer decided how to move the control surfaces to steer the airplane around. And 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 the thing that was necessary in the F-16 about that was it was something called an unstable airplane. And, and this, we're going to get into this as we talk about some of the observed phenomenon and stuff, but uh, uh, most airplanes are stable. And if you want to think of a stable airplane as um, you, you pick up a broom, and you hold the end of the handle up. If you push it to the side, it'll swing, but come back to center and stop. That's a stable system. If you if it's disturbed, it comes back to where you started. The F-16 was more of an unstable system. It was like balancing the broom handle on the end of your palm with the broom going vertically above your palm. And so now... The broom, if it if it tilts off to the side, it wants to keep going. It's unstable. And so the analogy that you have is that the sensors on the airplane detect that the airplane is starting to diverge. The broom is starting to move. It's sent to a computer, the equivalent of your brain. So your eyes are that the equivalent of the airplane sensors detecting the divergence, the tilting of the broom. Your brain is that flight control computer, and your hand represents the control surfaces that keep the broom upright. And in the case of the airplane, uh, as one of my bosses used to say, it keeps the pointy end into the wind. And so it makes the airplane artificially stable. But one of the really cool things about an unstable airplane is that it can maneuver more violently. It, It can change direction far more quickly than a stable airplane. So now let's all- get this straight because most of us don't ever want to be in an unstable airplane. I'm presuming. So when you <laughs> spoken from a from a true aerospace engineering perspective, you're saying that it's cool in some cases to be in an unstable airplane, and because of that, you can do things that you normally can't do in a more quote unquote stable aircraft. Is that correct? It's, it's absolutely correct. But it does. It has other benefits. It reduces drag. It, you know, can increase the performance of the airplane. There's a lot of benefits to what we call artificial stability. The computer is providing the stability instead of like the tail feathers on the arrow, keeping the arrow going straight ahead and, and stable. So that's the the trick behind it. And and all these successive airplanes that we talk about, you know, whether it's the F-18. The F-22, F-35 are all either unstable or relaxed stability airplanes. And you're even seeing relaxed stability airplanes now in commercial airliners because the benefit is reduced drag. So you get better fuel efficiency out of the aircraft. So this idea of computers helping stabilize the airplane and assist with the controls, and in the case of fighters, making them more maneuverable in the case of commercial transports, making them more efficient. That's, that's a natural discipline in how airplanes are designed today. I talked to somebody who was once a pilot in the F-16 and he told me that it was fundamentally one of the greatest experiences of his life because it's one of the few airplanes where the pilot in, in, in essence is sitting right on top of the nose cone and they put a canopy around you to protect you basically from the elements. And he said, you've never had quite the experience than you will traveling at supersonic speeds, literally sitting on the top of a nose cone of what feels like a rocket ship. I've sat in one with the canopy closed. And yeah, it's like sitting on a telephone pole, you know, with with kind of a bubble wrapped around you where you can see the world down below you. It's not like an airliner where you're trapped inside and looking through a little port. It feels like you're sitting out in the open. Well, but I want you to think about it from an air fighter pilot standpoint, you know, getting those Mark I eyeballs out there to see what is going on is absolutely critical. So having as much vision as you can possibly have is an advantage. I think I prefer to sit in coach with a cocktail, frankly. Oh, no, wait. You know, you want to sit in first class with a cocktail. Let's get that straight. Well, uh, yeah, of course, but I can't afford that. <laughs> well, neither can I, but but this is about want, okay? Well, that's true. <laughs> well, I know. I mean, we're, we're a small startup company. I, I ask <laughs> Tom all the time if I can fly first class, and I always wind up like in steerage with the rest of the luggage. So, I, of course, I always love talking with you about just fun things, but I think what I'd like to do now is shift gears a little bit and really start focusing on some of the work, uh, you know, not in a whole lot of detail, but let's face it, you work for, if not the, one of the most premier aerospace companies in the world. And not only the company itself, but you were part of their super elite team 
that worked on some very, very advanced projects. Um, and we're talking about none other than Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. Can you give me a little background for our listeners? What exactly is Skunk Works? Because I think people hear about it all the time and they kind of associate Skunk Works with like U2, Spy Plane and whatnot. But I'm not sure people really have a good understanding of what Skunk Works is. That's, it's a really good question, Lou. And within the inner circle of the defense aerospace, the Skunk Works is very legendary, but it's one of those organizations that quite honestly, for the longest time, didn't promote itself. You never saw skunks on anything. It quite honestly, didn't start kind of an outreach until the late 80s, early 90s. And Why the name and Skunk Works? Well, we have to flash back to its beginning in 1943 when you know, World War II is raging and suddenly these jets show up from Germany. And they were 150 miles per hour faster than our fastest fighters, the P-51 and P-38. That's like 30% faster, which is an enormous speed differential. And the war planners, they got some human intelligence that these things were in flight tests. And so they're trying to get pictures of them, determine their performance. And the war planners go, we need a counter to this. And the U.S. had played with jets for a while. But the jets they had developed, the prototypes were no faster than propeller-powered airplanes. And they said, you know, we need something that can compete with this ME-262 and and all the other jets and rocket planes that Germany is developing. And so Kelly caught wind of this and said, hey, we can give you something in 180 days, I think it was, six months to develop a jet airplane. And this was going to be an airplane that was going to, in level flight, hit speeds that our propeller-powered airplanes were going to be hitting in dives. And during the dives, these airplanes, would the control surfaces would get so stiff because of the aerodynamic pressures that they were almost uncontrollable. They were hitting the effects of supersonic flow, and it was causing instabilities, and the airplanes would crash. So Kelly Johnson, who was one of the visionary engineers at Lockheed Aircraft Company at the time, said, hey, we can do that. And he had always had a a vision for a very small experimental shop that would go solve really hard problems. And once that problem was solved, it would hand it off to the larger airplane company for production. So they sequestered themselves. Kelly comes back with a contract. The boss of the place says, that's really great, but we're in wartime production. You cannot disrupt any production. You can't have any people, equipment, or facilities. You know, good luck. So Kelly actually used torn down engine crates from the engines off the B-17 that Lockheed was producing under license, draped kind of a circus tent over that, and built a lean-to against one of the buildings down at the south end of the factory. Bought a local machine shop in Burbank and hired all the employees, so he had his own machine shop, and and scavenged up engineers. That was about 90,000 people down in Burbank at the time working. So he would just pull a few people out that wouldn't be missed and went to go develop this this jet. And one of the problems with the tent was it's kind of hot. And uh, right outside across the railroad tracks from where Kelly set this tent up was a plastics factory. And there's no emission controls in these days. And so these fumes would go wafting across. And there was a, a guy named Irv Culver that was a big fan of the Little Abner cartoon. And the Little Abner cartoon... There was this little house up on the hill that had a still in it that made this thing called Kickapoo Joy Juice. And it was called the Skonk Works, S-K-O-N-K. And so all kinds of weird smells would come out of the place. Nobody really knew what went on up there, and it was kind of dangerous to go near the place. And to Irv, where he was working was kind of like that. It was smelly. He couldn't tell anybody what he was doing because it was so secretive. And so one day, he just the phone rings. He picks it up, and he answers Skonk Works. And it actually was a general calling about another program, but had been inadvertently routed to the experimental shop. And Kelly was furious. And, you know, he fired Irv, and, but, you know, Irv had to be back at work the next day. And the name kind of stuck, and it stuck well enough that Al Cap, the cartoonist for Little Abner, contacted Lockheed and said, that's a copyrighted name you're using. So they changed S-K-O-N-K to S-K-U-N-K and made no it kidding. Skunk Works. Yeah. Wow. So it, it was it was this small experimental shop that would go solve hard problems. And, and it was very secretive. So it typically worked on highly classified things. 
and involved into a, an organization that developed specialized technologies, did limited production, and worked on in the area of breakthroughs. So you go from this, this little shop that's doing very secret work for the U.S. government to becoming this world-leading premier organization setting the gold standard for R&D aerospace really across the planet. And some of the world's most incredible technologies have come out of Skunk Works. With that said, you leave a company like that. You are one of the most senior guys in the company and you decide to jump on board this pirate ship called TTSA. What led you to do that? What was the decision-making process of Steve Justice? Obviously, you're an extremely logical person, but you're also a man of deep faith, and I don't think people really know that, and right. and I respect that tremendously about you. I guess my question is, how do you go from being one of the top dogs at Lockheed Martin Skunk Works to now working for TTSA, the small startup company led by a maverick of a rock star? So let's back up just a bit. So I meet Tom. We're friends. And he's talking a lot about, you know, how do we do advanced technology, those kinds of things. And I would provide guidance to him. Uh, when he would go brief a general, he would call me up and say, you know, what, what's kind of the protocols here? How, you know, what's, what are the expectations? And so I would provide him some guidance every now and then about, you know, how to, how to step into those meetings. We were talking in 2016, he goes, I want to stand up a company to do this, you know, to go solve these problems, to look at how these UAPs fly. And if, if I do that, would you be interested in being a part of that? And I said, yeah, sure. You know, my retirement's coming up here. Sure. And I thought it'd take him two or three years to do it, you know, to be perfectly honest with you. And so we go into 2017, I'm meeting my requirements for my personal retirement. And I'll, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I was burning out. Uh, I was traveling 40 to 45 weeks out of the year um, and had been doing that for several years. Uh, some of the efforts I led were 100 to 120 hour weeks. I was starting to get a little tired here, you know. And, Steve, and- is, is it fair to say that sometimes in order to improve an organization, you have to leave it? You absolutely do. And one of the things that was really important to me was mentoring. And I had a group of people that I had mentored that were coming up through the ranks and were going to be ready to take over the organization. You know, a lot of my bosses retired at 55, you know, and here I am 62 and, and I'm hanging on. And so there, there was this just confluence of where the program was, how the organization was evolving, um, my criteria for retiring. And it, it all kind of came to a head um, and, and Tom standing up this organization all kind of, you know, aligned. And it, it was like, you know, it's, it's time for me to get out of the way. I can appreciate that. And I respect that. I could go on and on for the next 10 days listening about your, your background. I find it fascinating. It's kind of, for me, aerospace has always been kind of a passion for me, even though I'm not, obviously not very good at it. With that said, let's talk about really the reason why we're all here together, and that's the topic of unidentified aerial phenomena or, or UAPs or in the vernacular UFOs. You know, you mentioned Kelly Johnson earlier in this mm-hmm. talk. Correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't Kelly Johnson have some sort of famous incident involving UAPs or was that somebody else? No, that, that was Kelly. And that's part of why when Tom asked me, would you like to go try to engineer these vehicles? It was on my radar screen, so to speak, of interest items. So one of my jobs at the Skunk Works was to be the historian, one of those great unpaid opportunities that shows up. So I'm, I'm digging through. I, I would do my work and you know get it to be 6.30 or 7 o'clock at night, and I would pull some of Kelly's papers out just to see what I had because I had this huge collection of his stuff. So I wanted to kind of inventory things. So I'd pull out you know a one-inch stack and... And I pull up this one and it says sighting of an unidentified flying object by certain Lockheed personnel. And I, I remember, you know, the eyes kind of rolling back into my head. And I flash back for a second to very early in my career where someone that I would trust with my life saw a, an unidentified flying object and told me about it and, you know, described it as being a mile across, you know, at night and 
yeah, it wasn't a fleeting moment kind of thing, you know, and, and, you know, they weren't stoned or any of this kind of stuff. And they knew what airplanes were, you know, familiar with aviation and all that kind of stuff. So uh, while I was dismissive, then I, I shouldn't have been. And so I look at this paper by Kelly. So I flip it open and it's from the 1950s. And if there's a cover letter where it was sent to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And so I flipped past that and Kelly was at his ranch and said he saw this thing in the sky and he described it and drew pictures of it. And he described another incident he had. But what was interesting to me were there were several of his flight test team that were up in a constellation doing flight tests that saw the exact same thing that he did. And so I look at it and I go, okay, you know, these are people that know what airplanes are. They know what swamp gas is. They know what clouds are. This was something that they could not explain. And, and they had cooperating witnesses, you said, right? Yeah. This, so this is multiple viewpoints and multiple people of the same thing at the same time. I step back and I go, okay, these are airplane designers, <laughs> okay? And they work advanced technologies out of the skunk works. And I'm going to step back for a minute. I'm going to push aside all the stigma stuff. I'm going to push aside, where did it come from? Who's behind the wheel? This means it can be done. (laughs) And that to me looks like a hard problem. And one of the things that I always ask my bosses for were the low probability of win, low probability of go, the hard programs, the difficult programs. Which is something Skunk Works is kind of known for, right? Solving those difficult problems. Absolutely. But I asked for the hard ones within the skunk works. You know, I I need something to really sink my fangs into. So it it was like, this looks like a a really hard problem and nobody seemed to have answers to it. And so it kind of lies dormant for a long time. And then Tom shows up with this question of, you know, would you like to go try to solve that problem? When he came in talking about this stuff, I said, well, here's this. And I checked and the Kelly documents are out on the Internet. So it's not like I was giving anything away from inside the Skunk Works. And and so when the the opportunity came up, it was going to be a chance to take on a different pace and and learn some new things. So I retired on a Friday and I set myself up the following Wednesday to fly to Austin, Texas, to sit down with Hal Pudoff and his team, just playing sponge, just asking questions and listening. It was interesting and sobering and perplexing and a whole bunch of new for me, which is energizing, to be perfectly honest with you. I like I like new, I like different, I like difficult. So it was feeding that thing inside of me like the Skunk Works programs would do. You know, Steve, what I find so wonderful about TTSA is that you have all sorts of personalities on board and you really have this incredible balance within the team. You know, you have Tom, who's a super hyper creative individual and a big dreamer. You know, he's made his living and a a successful career off of following his dreams. And then, of course, we have you, we have a little pet name for you, and that's the Dream Crusher. Because <laughs> yeah. you, you are this super hyper vigilant, logical person. And uh, I've even been sometimes subject to that where I'll come in and say, hey, Steve, I got a great idea. And of course, I leave about 10 minutes later with, with hat in hand and usually a few tears in my eyes, recognizing that maybe it wasn't such a great idea. But Well, oh, okay, so let's talk about that for just a minute, because at, at the Skunk Works, the way I described myself, and this comes from actually listening to people talk about me, I was the guy that had rainbows, unicorns, lollipops, and candy canes circling around in my head. I was the dream guy, and I always picked deputies that were, to use Tom's term, the dream crushers, the people that were the hard facts, you know, why are you doing this, asking really hard questions, because I needed that grounding. Absolutely. I, no, I it works. I needed that diversity of cognitive thought. I needed hard questions asked just so I wasn't driving off into the weeds. And so I come into TTSA and everybody has rainbows, unicorns, lollipops, and candy canes circling around in their head. And it was kind of like, well, somebody's got to be the grounding element here. No, you're, you're absolutely right, Steve. And, and honestly, it works. I did the same thing when I was in the world of intelligence for an entire career. You've got to have that balance. And it really works wonderfully because I think ultimately at the end, we have you know the directions that we go in wind up being more realistic, as you said, more grounded. But at the same time, you, know, you have this, this wonderful push and pull 
relationship, you know, it's never adversarial. It's this healthy friction, this devil's advocate of, okay, if we want to do this, then what is the realistic possibility that we're going to be able to achieve success? And what does success look like? And what are the milestones and deliverables and benchmarks and all the things that are kind of inconvenient people don't want to think about when you're dreaming. But if you want that dream to come true, you've got to go through that process. And I think it's extremely helpful. Absolutely. And, and just so everybody knows, what I do is we're, you know, is hashing through a new idea. I ask just really hard questions. If somebody's idea is crushed, they've done that inside their own head. All I've done is force other people to think about alternative perspectives. As I used to say, I love running with scissors blindfolded along the edge of a cliff. That is so much fun for me. But by the same token, you know, there's, there's also boundaries that I have to respect. So I ask just really, really tough questions. I do what my deputies would do to me when I was putting a dream out. And I try to caution people, there's a good idea in here. Let's just make sure that, you know, we're grounded and not just running what's called open loop you know, and steering off into a, a useless direction. And, and Lou, you've heard me say this over and over. There's four types of information out there. There's no, what you know, what you hear, what you think, and what you believe. And you've got to separate things out into that category. And all too often, we'll put the category of what we think or believe into what we know. And, and what you know is supposed to be that absolutely substantiated, three different ways, stands up to all sorts of scrutiny, indisputable fact. And so that's the grounding point that I try to use here. And so the questions I ask will be trying to draw out what the facts are so that we can separate that out. And then, and then we'll talk about what we hear, what we think, and what we believe, because there's very often good ideas in those other categories. It's not that you want to be dismissive of them, but you want to be very realistic about what you're talking about because what you want to try to do is not be blind to either opportunity or risk. That actually reminds me of of an old saying they used to say when I was in the government, the enemy of a good idea is poor planning. And if you don't do that proper planning and homework, it doesn't matter how good your idea is, it's not going to succeed. Right. And one of the things, and I always encourage this, we'd have what I'll call spirited debate about what a decision should be. I like that word, spirited debate. Spirited debate, debate. yes. I'm going to say that next time I'm talking to my daughter about her grades in college. (laughs) Exactly. Um, So it's, it's incumbent on me as a leader to listen to all the ideas and then Um, make a decision, but also explain to the team why I've made that decision. Somebody's going to be upset. It won't be the decision that they think we should have made. So, And this spirited debate you were having with your people, I'd like to hear more about that. um, One of the things that I really appreciated about the teams that I got to work with, I didn't always get to pick my teams, but one of the things that I always appreciated was people speaking their mind. I want to know where people really stood, you know, and what they thought about the the challenge that was in front of us, because I needed to make sure I wasn't missing something. My dad always taught me, surround yourself with people smarter than you. And so as a leader, the talent that surrounded me was breathtaking. I tried to make sure I was not the smartest person in the room. Um, yeah, so, I, I think you're right. I, yeah. I did the, the same thing, fortunately. And I think anybody who's worked with me will definitely attest I was probably of everybody in the group always least intelligent. Uh, but I was smart enough to know to surround myself with, with incredibly talented individuals. Yeah, you have to surround yourself. You know, and now what's incumbent on the leader is to bring the wisdoms in and to assimilate what everyone is saying, to put it in context to, you know, any of the stuff raining down from above and make the best strategic decisions you possibly can. One of the things I always, as a leader, tried desperately to do was to have decisions made at the lowest possible level. I didn't want to have to be the person making every one of the decisions because that meant all the information was going to have to flow up to me. And my days didn't allow that. I had to manage up as well as manage down. 
So for strategic things, I needed for those to be brought to me. You have to delegate that. So I actually would set up a, a thing called RAD in my organization, roles, responsibilities, accountability, and decision-making. And for each box on the org chart, I identified role, responsibility, accountability, and decision-making. And I would brief that to the team so that they knew who was responsible for making what decisions. And that works wonderfully. Uh, I wish I'd figured it out much earlier in my career. But yeah, pushing decision-making down is is really critical because it allows you to maintain program momentum because decisions can be made on the spot. So, Steve, what is your job function at TTSA? The big job function for me in, in terms of materially contributing to TTSA is the aerospace division director. So if we look at the, the continuum of what we're dealing with, we have the observed phenomena out there, you know, the, the videos or radar tracks or eyewitnesses or whatever it is. In parallel with that, if there is materials that we believe are connected with these that people have collected over time, we'll put it in the category of evidence. So how do we pair that up and explain what's going on? How do we then tie it to, we'll say, the, the mathematics of it, the, the physics, like what Hal brings to the equation to try to understand the model of what is going on? And then from that, we have to extract what are the technologies that realize this model? that turn theory into some sort of physical element, whether it's thrust or, you know, Tom uses the term anti-gravity, whatever it is, how do we make it real? And then there's a step of, okay, well, you've got, you know, the equivalent of a jet engine sitting there. That doesn't fly. If, if you start it up on a dolly, it'll just go careening across the ramp someplace. So then how do you incorporate that into a system that gives us capability we can exploit? And so my job is to kind of pick from the evidence and start working through the, the science and the theory and the models to the technologies, to the applications. So let's talk about that then. Can you give our listeners from your opinion? I know we got a lot of different projects going on. A lot of them are very exciting, but, yeah. but if you had to pick Three. What were those three projects that TTSA is working on that you think are potentially really great value or that give you personal satisfaction the most? Well, one is the work that Hal is doing regarding there's there's two things associated with Hal's work. One is this engineering the space time metric, because that's that critical puzzle piece of figuring out how we take advantage of that evidence and how we might make things work. That project to me is really interesting because this is almost the equivalent of trying to figure out how to make an engine that powers an airplane. The other day we had a Kind of like you said, right? World War II, we're flying propeller airplanes and all of a sudden the Germans show up with these, you know, complete paradigm changing technologies called a jet engine. And now all of a sudden we've got to figure out how it works. Right. Exactly. Now, but let's put this in the proper perspective. People will say, well, you know, that's a great analogy. So we're, we're ready to now build an airplane because we got a jet engine. So I, the analogy in a teleconference we had the other day was to have a locomotive that is pulling a train down the track. That's the ultimate objective. The starting point for that is some sort of early version of man walking out to a lake on a very cool morning and seeing vapor rising from a lake going, what is that? And now we figure out that it's water. Okay. There's an energy process in there that's converting it from the water in the lake to this vapor that's rising up. Wow. There's energy associated with that. There's something, can we do something that? So now we go and we study water in this other state and we get the steam and steam has a lot of energy inside of it. Okay. So how do we make steam? So now we make steam. Now, how do we turn steam into something that creates an energy for us? Okay. We've got a lot of this, this energy stored in steam, but how do we extract that energy into a mechanical device? So now there's a piston that moves. We inject steam into this piston and it moves. Okay, now how do we convert that motion into a rotary 
motion that powers a wheel. Okay, now let's, how do we scale that up enough to put it onto something that can move forward? And, right. and in, in make- the meantime, having to invent a, a condensator, a transmission, drive shafts, pulleys, all that infrastructure that's yeah, all that supporting set of technologies that's out there to make it into what becomes a locomotive that's pulling cars behind it. Yeah. Right. So for literally a glass of water to now all of a sudden a multi ton locomotive pulling cargo, you know, across the United States. Right. So we're down at what we call the far left end of that scale. One of the the questions we always get is, you know, how come you haven't built that vision vehicle yet? You know, we've seen these these objects flying around in the sky that fly in a way that I I want to like I say I want to create that. We have a glimpse, as I said, at the kickoff back in October of 2017 into the physics of how that might be done. We've collected some evidence out there. And, you know, there's this is one of the strange things about the evidence that I want to talk about for just a minute. We have this one piece of material that's existed since the, I think, 96. And allegedly before then. Allegedly, it's from like the 1950s. But we don't have any... I'll call it validated documentation of that. We can prove where it's been since 1996. Uh, So this is this piece of magnesium bismuth that that people have read about. Know, hear, think, and believe. What we know, it's been around since 1996. We hear a lot of stuff about it, okay? But we that's what we know. And what's interesting to me is the machines to build this when I first came on board, we were having some dialogue about it, and we had the input of some material engineers, material scientists. Material scientists didn't know why you would stick those two pieces of material together. The machines to do it didn't really allow those two materials to stick together. That's interesting to me. Now, we're getting to a stage where we have the machines that can make these materials stick together, put them together at the thicknesses that we're observing, um, which is almost on an atom-by-atom basis. Um, And uh, there's been some analysis done by universities that show that it turns into something called a subcritical waveguide, which means it's, it's propagating energy at very high frequencies when it should not be carrying energy through it. So that's... That's interesting to me. I, I like what you're saying with that because I, I've often told people, you know, there's there's nothing uncommon about seeing a 747 at an international airport. What would be uncommon seeing that aircraft would be, for example, inside of an Egyptian tomb, right? That, right. Because, because that technology didn't exist back then, so you wouldn't expect to find right. something. And so here we are, a piece of material – That has been put together in a way that technically at the time, there was no necessarily purpose or technology at the time to construct that material that way. Is that that a correct assertion? That is a correct assertion. The caution in this is, you know, we found this piece of thing we don't understand. And so let's let's assume that it's the 1800s and we're in a covered wagon we're going to go make a new life in California. So we're going across a desert and we run across this piece of metal. When we camp out one night and we're sitting next to the fire and there's this piece of metal and it's, it's really strange looking. It's clearly made out of, you know, it's metal, but it's been shaped in a way that we don't understand. It's got a long stem on it with kind of a flared, with a flared end, like a hat on the end of it. And it has a precision to it that we're not used to. You know, we see the the iron that's being used on the wheels of our wagon and the hub of the wagon and that kind of thing. But this is made unlike anything that we've ever seen. And, and we don't understand what it is. Now, let's flash forward and say that it is the exhaust valve out of a 454 V8 from an early 70s Corvette. Okay. Right. Where do you start with that? Right. But the question is, you know, the thing is, we don't know what an exhaust valve is. We don't know what a V8 is and we don't know what a Corvette is. Okay. And, and the question is, it did this piece that we find, you know, is it an exhaust valve? Is it something that materially contributes to, we'll call it the propulsion, like an exhaust valve would in a Corvette? Or is it a part of the glove box? 
You know, that's an ornamental thing that has nothing to do with the function of it. So, you know, we don't know any of that. And, and it's our job as detectives to try to do experimentation with these materials, with all the evidence that we have to ferret out whatever facts we possibly can that provide direction for the theory and exploitation of the theory. And, and this is where the artificial intelligence comes in. Uh, this, this is another one of the really exciting things that I see going on with Joe Sherman in one of the previous podcasts. Great guy. Love talking with him. But this yeah, is he's incredibly where, intelligent. Oh, uh, yeah. Frighteningly smart. Uh, and I'm so glad that he's on board. But the system that he brings is going to allow us to find dots that we can't see because of our own perception limitations, our own preconceived notions, how we see things and maybe connect dots in a way that we are unable to connect them. We had this discussion the other day as well. Our vocabulary is very limited in trying to explain this stuff. I mean, we're trying to explain it in the context of the stuff that we experience in our lives. You know, I, Right, our current paradigm. Our current paradigm. You know, if you were to take a smartphone back to medieval times and ask them to tell you what it was, and they were to write it down and we were to read it today, they would say that it is a small box. It emits fire, you know, because of the light coming out of it, that it captures the essence of a person and, and freezes. The essence of that person is stopped for some reason. And it brings up words that out of nowhere that magically appear and a voice emits from it. it. It is this possessed thing that responds to me when I ask it a question. And so, you know, we would get these descriptions and go, what the heck are they describing? Because their vocabulary is not capable of telling us what that is. And so, you know, how dare we try to explain what we see using our vocabulary? You know, it's, a, it's a giant caution flag that's waving. Well, and it's kind so, of like yeah. that, that old saying, right, where I guess there's certain Inuit indigenous people, they have something like 50 different words to describe snow, right? And of course, we here in the lower 48, we just say that's snow. But to them, it's not yeah. just snow. There's, there's 50 different, you know, versions of it. Right. So you mentioned that of the three projects, uh, the space-time metric engineering, you talked a little bit about the metamaterials work and also AI. So Now, one of the things that's really important and, and is part of the business model of TTSA is with this discovery that's going on, it's telling the story of this journey that we're on. You know, we talked about the continuum from observing the lake to a locomotive. We're, we're on this journey of discovery here. And so telling that story of that journey I think is really important. So you have the unidentified that's providing one set of perspectives. Uh, you, you have this, this podcast, TTSA Talks podcast is another way of sharing the journey. Tell, you know, Tom's got, you know, books and movies and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, a domain where my brain does not work at all. <laughs> you know, it's just that whole entertainment side is really new to me. But, you know, that's an important element of that. There's some really interesting stuff here. And as a human, why would we not be curious about that? A couple of the attributes of the human being that I just love is the ability to wonder and inquisitiveness. It's beyond curiosity. It's asking questions. It's, it's digging into things, even if it's risky. What an incredible domain to be able to wonder and ask questions to try to understand what is going on. Well, speaking of asking questions, I'm going to ask you a tough question, and I want to hear your perspective. Uh, I'm sure there's some folks in our audience that want to hear this as well and would like to hear your honest opinion. TTSA is a B corporation. A lot of what we do is for public benefit. If that being the case, then why are we partnered up with the United States government and what good can possibly come of anything with TTSA partnering up with the United States Army? I mean, the Army is, is an organization that goes to war. 
Uh, it develops weapons of war. From your perspective, can you give me the Steve Justice rationale why a company like TTSA would want to partner with the United States government? I respect that people have concerns about how the government may use information, how they may, you know, the threat of, of locking down information, of not talking. But what I'll say in the case of the folks that we work the CRADA with, you know, and, and people need to understand this CRADA did not show up overnight. You know, there's a lot of relationships you had, Lou, inside the government and, you know, still have to this day that are rich and productive. And there was a group of people within the army that you connected with that had, I'm going to call it that wonder and inquisitiveness. And the really good thing about what they bring to this is they've got a lot of smart people. They've got some facilities that don't just exist anywhere. And with the structure of a CRADA that allows the sharing of information that's generated and considering the enthusiasm of these people on the Army side to want to investigate this, to move the ball down the field, it, it seemed like a natural partnership. And I get that, Steve. But what if these people want to build weapons of war with this technology? Because, you know, from my perspective, Steve, I'll tell you, I'm unapologetic. I am a, a very patriotic American, and none of us in TTSA who've worked for the government, either directly as an employee or as a contractor, I think want to do anything against our government. We are very patriotic individuals. Right. And for right. me, I don't look at it as building of weapons of war. We can provide technology that helps even just one of our brave men and women in uniform to come home safely and, and be back with their families and have a, a holiday dinner, then to me, that's worth it. I, I don't look at it as building weapons of war. I look at it as building a defense around our people and the technology we're dealing with. I personally don't see it being used in that application. And you're absolutely right. They bring lots and lots to the table. They bring resources and experimental equipment that would cost millions and millions of dollars and unless somebody wants to plop that kind of money into our lap, we have to rely on others to help us and partner in these type of endeavors. Right. Yeah. It, it, to, to make progress, you, you can't do anything by yourself, especially today. You need all kinds of partnerships. And, and the Army is not the only partnership that we're working in this domain. So it's important to make sure you don't arbitrarily turn away help. One of the most powerful pieces of advice I got from one of my mentors, he said to me one time, I was really stumbling badly. And he, he looked at me and he goes, Steve, the five most powerful words in the universe are, will you please help me? And that's absolutely true. And so to solve these problems, lots of people need to engage to build a new jet engine. So this is technology we know how to do. We've built lots of jet engines is a five to 10 year thing and billions and billions of dollars. That's to do something we know how to do. <laughs> and it involves using labs and facilities all across the country to do that. All right, now we're dealing with something we don't understand. I want to do a philosophical, I, 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 you know, a personal position, and this is Steve Justice speaking. As flawed as, as our nation may be, I believe we get it about right. I'm, I'm a firm believer that there is good and bad in, in the universe. And so there are people out there, and I know most Americans haven't been exposed to what you and I have been exposed to, but there's people out there that want to undermine what we have. And the level of sacrifice that is being made on a daily basis that allows us to live the lives that that we live, it is stunning to me, the sacrifice of our young men and women. I don't consider war to be a sport. War is a horrible, horrible thing. My dad was in World War II and described very vividly to me some of the experiences he had. And I remember when my selective service card came when I turned 18, 
And he just looked up and said, I fought enough war for you and every one of your classmates. And he never said another word about it. It's, it's a huge burden borne by a very tiny percentage of our population. And yet it goes on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so if we have to fight, I don't want it to be fair. I want it to be an unfair fight if we've got to do that. And right, an overwhelming, crushing, win. crushing, absolutely, absolutely crushing. Because as you said, and I actually have given that exact speech, not only inside the United States as I speak to civic groups, but also I was invited to speak over in the Netherlands and Australia. I want the good guys to come home to their families. I want that really bad. I want every good guy to come home to their family. I agree with you, Steve, 100%. I don't. I think everybody in TTSA agrees with that. We're not looking to hurt anybody. We're looking to save people with hopefully some of these technologies. I hope. I, I hope so. It is controversial, but but I I see us by moving the ball down the field. The commercial applications for this are breathtaking. It is stunning. The technology, what it would bring to us, will change life as much as the computer has changed our life or, you know, having air conditioning <laughs> changed our lives. I agree. I agree with you 100%, Steve. You're, you're absolutely right. Steve, I'm going to go ahead and shift gears now real quick because we have some friends of ours out in the uh, social media world, uh, in particular the Twitter sphere. And what I want to do is make sure we have enough time to address some of their questions. So if you're okay, I'd like to, to go through a couple of their questions. Far away. All right, so John asks, all right, Steve, please comment on this. According to Ben Richard, CEO of Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, in 1993, he said, we now have the technology to take E.T. home. The question that John asks is, is he nuts or what? I'll, I'm going to say, you know, I, I've, I've seen this quote, and I've, I've seen it just – propagate like crazy, especially through the, the social media world and that kind of stuff. And I've heard it attributed to a number of things, to private conversations, but in speeches is where one of the common threads is. And as the historian for the Skunk Works, yeah, this this was a question I had too. And, and, and I actually worked with Ben um, and sat in his office and talked with him about all kinds of subjects, including this. And he never said that to me. OK, but one of the really interesting things, Ben wrote down all of his speeches. They, they were all written out, including the listing of the slides out there. So what what is in the social media world is that we say we have this ability to take E.T. home and he shows a slide of a flying saucer up there. So I remember looking through Ben's speeches, and, and I remember this just as clearly as can be, and because the slide that's called out for this little paragraph is skunk in the clouds. So that was one of the slides we would put up as a thing of, hey, we're working on pretty cool stuff out there. You know, wait a decade or two and you might see it. Uh, so, but it was to indicate that the skunk had a future out there, but we couldn't discuss it. So the skunk in the clouds was the identified slide. And, and I used it many times when I was giving speeches to civic groups or schools or whatever, but his, uh, his actual words in the speech were, I'm going to try to remember this as clearly as I possibly can was like, you may be wondering what we're working on in the skunk works now, and we can't talk about it, but I want you to know we've just been awarded a contract to build this with this, the skunk in the clouds to fly E.T. back home, okay? That's what I have written down that he said. And so, you know, things change over time and that kind of stuff. And there's perceptions and distortions. I, I can't, like you say, I can't speak for any private conversations Ben had. I can speak to the private conversation he had with me. Uh, well, let me, let me ask subject. you this, Steve, uh, on that. I mean, if someone has a technology to send the Mars rover to go, uh, let's say, onto Mars or an asteroid or another planet and collect soil samples and bring it back home, and there happens to potentially be microbial life or some sort of alien life form, 
is that really that far fetched? NASA actually has plans to do just that, don't they? To actually take soil samples and and bring them back here to to our planet and and look at these samples. They do, but but the context that I knowing Ben, he was the joke master. I mean, just loved humor and he loved messing with people. And so to me, this statement, particularly when he's frustrated that he can't get credit for what, you know, the skunk work was doing to help Lockheed shareholders, you know, and, and Lockheed investors. And quite honestly, in a lot of cases, executive leadership know what was going on. It, it was a frustration point for him. So he would put big, fluffy statements out there that sounded so off the wall. They were so just uh, provocative statements, just provocative as could be. Um, I remember when the F 117 stealth fighter was black, um, he made statements. Like, you know, we have stuff going on in the desert that's just decades ahead of your imagination. And he was specifically talking about the stealth fighter, but people attribute that to whatever they want it to be. But he was so, so incredibly frustrated that he couldn't get credit for this incredible breakthrough of stealth technology. So it, it manifested itself in multiple ways. So I, I attribute it more to to that. But that's the real life quote of Ben. Like I say, he may have said the other, but he didn't do it to me. And it was in none of the transcripts of his speeches. Okay. Well, John, there you go. Heard it from the man himself. Tony asks, Steve, how is it possible to navigate a craft at the speed with which UAP are traveling or estimated by scientists, wouldn't the risk of striking a foreign object occur along the flight path, whether here or in space? Okay, so I love this question because that's the question I had. When I went down to um, Austin for that first trip and met with Hal and his team, you know, it was the discussion of engineering the space time metric, how you warp space time to, to create these what we observe as really high speeds, you know, in our world, that's how we describe it as speed to when you're warping space time, it's not really speed. It's this different phenomenon. And one of my questions was, if, if you open up, you know, a wormhole, if you start distorting space time, number one, do you know where you're going to end up? And they said, well, right now, we're not quite sure how you fix where the end of the open wormhole is. And I go, well, guys, you know, this is a fundamental problem. <laughs> you know, if we want to get to someplace in particular, how do you make sure you end up there as opposed to, you know, six galaxies over? Yeah, there's something? a lot of other places you can end up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it would be not so good, I would think. So, you know, there, there was these questions. Now, when you start engineering the space-time metric, you are warping space and time and, and matter isn't like what it is, but I'll, I'll go back. I mean, I'm, I'm not a Trekkie by any stretch of the imagination, but I definitely remember in, in Star Trek where they, you know, part of setting the course was making sure you weren't going to hit anything when you went, you know, into warp drive. So that's part of what we have to figure out. What are the effects of as you as you warp the fabric of space time as you engineer that you know are, are planets solid there there's a there are so many questions that come with that that it's unbelievable but that's so the short answer to your question is not not quite sure how to navigate at those speeds and as as we see like in the the one I think it's called FLIR one where one shoots off the the screen of the at FLIR. Um, and, and as I would talk to Dave Fravor about the, the tic tac that he saw, you know, rocketing away from him. And then, and then suddenly, you know, it was actually at uh, his rally point, um, which was what, 60 miles away or something like that. And he, the, the tic tac was suddenly there, you know, that's pretty short distance. I, I would think, you know, if you figured out engineering space time, that that's pretty simple by comparison, so, but that's, that's part of, as we talked about building a locomotive and you got to have the boiler and all that other stuff to go with it, the valves and everything. That's part of the other stuff we have to figure out 
working up from steam to something that's a realizable machine. So Steve, that's that's fascinating. That's a great answer. You know, as described to me by some of the scientists when I was at ATIP, they said that it's really all relative. In essence, what happens is that although it may be appearing fast from the outside, what you have is two different things going on. From the perspective of being inside that UAP, everything else around you is going in slow motion. Right. In essence, you know, you have time to get around what you want because from your perspective, you're not really going fast. It's just a normal walk in the park. But all of the world around you tends to be going in this weird slow motion type thing. And therefore, you know, it's just kind of this whole Einstein theory of relativity type stuff that I don't quite understand, but I I can appreciate it. We paid a lot of money to scientists at the Pentagon for them to understand it. Yep. All right. So, Steve, I got time for one last question for you. Uh, This is coming from Dan. And Dan asks... The default response of debunkers to videos and sightings of UAP is that they are drones, seagulls, etc. Can you describe flight performance capabilities of our most advanced drones today? And how about drones for 20 years from now and 50 years from now? Are we looking at technology that currently exists? So that's a great question, Dan. The, the drones we have today are airplanes. They're the equivalent of airplanes or helicopters. They, they exhibit very known and predictable flight characteristics. There was a, a drone done back in the, gosh, late 70s, early 80s called HIMAT that was a, an unmanned system dropped from a B-52 to examine, you know, pulling big Gs and, and is, is high, HIMAT stood for high maneuverability advanced technology or something like that. Um, it was to, to look at extreme maneuverability in, in aircraft, but that's, that's kind of the exception. The drones today fly like airplanes that we understand 20 years from now. I think the things that that you'll see, uh, drones will just be a whole lot smarter. You're going to start seeing artificial intelligence come into this to where there's, there's more autonomy in drones. Um, I think they will still be fundamentally like airplanes or helicopters. I think you may see some speed increases. You know, hypersonics is a really big thing in the development world. So uh, you could see some some hypersonic drones start to show up, but they're going to be like rifle bullets just zipping along. They're not going to be demonstrating the characteristics in these videos that you see that are, have been released to this point in time and what people have observed for decades with these unexplained phenomena. Mm. So still pretty much tied to conventional technology, if you will. Right. And, and 50 years from now, who, who knows? You know, I mean, I, hopefully we figured this stuff out that we're, we're jetting to the stars, you know, that we're out there. Last night, I drove out and, and went and looked at Neowise, the comet that's out there. So I drove out, and there's the Milky Way out there, um, just as bright as can be. You know, starlight is, is creating shadows. And um, wouldn't it be cool to go there? Steve, thank you for this most amazing discussion. You know, I've had the honor and privilege of working with you. And I get the chance to talk to you anytime I want to. But for some of our listeners, you know, you're really kind of the the main hero of TTSA. And I really am grateful that you've given us time and our listeners time to hear kind of thoughts according to Steve Justice. So thank thank you for this amazing opportunity and discussion. I sincerely appreciate it. And and a big thank you to our listeners out there that are listening to our TTSA podcast. You know, we we're doing this for you. We want to make sure that you have an opportunity to sit in the same room and ask Steve questions and appreciate Steve and everybody in TTSA for their contributions. And Steve, it has been a tremendous honor to, to work with you. you. You really are a legend. I heard about you when I was still in the government. Uh, and to be working with you is just, um, it's just completely a, a profound and surreal experience. But I want to thank you for that. Thank you, Lou. That's, that's very kind of you. Thank you. And the same back at you. It's it's a privilege to to be able to just sit down and, and spend time with you. Yeah, well, the, the honor and pleasure is mine, I can assure you, Steve. And for our listeners, again, thank you very much. Please be sure to subscribe to the podcast if you enjoy it. And if you do, please rate the review. 
and uh, you know support our, our TTSA talks and our podcasts on Apple. If this is something you you like and you want to hear more, to stay updated on the latest news and developments from TTSA, please visit to the stars and sign up to our mailing list and we'll give you updates on a regular and routine basis. And until then, folks, please be safe. Thank you for listening with us today. Steve, thank you. And everybody have a great day and God bless. Stay safe. For more TTSA talks, please visit to the stars academy.com. Mm-hmm.